We offer to the water, we offer revitalizing liquid that is pure, that is clean, that will mix with you to rebirth and to help you to rejuvenate yourself. We offer our thanks for the nourishment that you give us and we bless you and we bless you and we bless you and we give thanks. And we apologize for the mistreatment that you have suffered and we ask that you forgive us and we ask that you continue to flow in good health and vitalization. Blessings be upon all of us for all the creation and we thank the mother who in her wisdom has provided us this wondrous resource. We thank the trees who stand guard and stand as a record keeper, who allow and to help this river flow. We thank you and we thank you and we bless you. We thank you for the nourishment, Mother, that you give us in your wisdom. We thank you for all that live in the water, upon the water, that use the water for every part of their being. We thank you for the connection to our blood that you give us and we thank the grandmother and the grandfather for their part in the plane of our health. Mani lo he ya ne wa le o e na he o wa na ye ni o wa ye la e na o e na ya o e ya ne sinu wa pi na wo na e o e na o wa ne lo e. Thank you, Mother. For everywhere this river goes, we send blessings and we thank, send healing and we thank, send our gratitude and our love. And we ask you to help us to do better. And we ask that you survive. Wa wa ye We call in the winds. We ask the winds to come to move the water, to purify for us. We ask the winds to come to bless us, to move the water along, to help in its cleansing. We thank the rocks as it goes over that it provides that cleansing that we need. Thank you for coming and thank you for blessing us. We ask you, come, come, come to us and to bless us and caress us as you come. This is a part of our heritage. Our blood is in this land and in this water. It is for everyone but we ask everyone to own it and to keep it and to bless it and hold it sacred. Halo. We have um, a lot of work to do in terms of helping people in the area in DC, the metro area to understand who we are and, our, and listen to our story. and. Um, Get the, get the Piscataway name out there and say, we've been here 13,000 years. We are still here.
the rivers in Washington, D.C. were very important resources to the both prehistoric and historic people who lived along them. They were perfect places for abundant resources like fish and, and shellfish and uh, deer that would come and, and feed on the uh, grasses of the rolling hills. Um, they were a great place for trade because the rivers acted almost as a prehistoric highway. You would bring your goods up and down the rivers and trade with other uh, tribes. And some of the things that we find archaeologically uh, in Washington, D.C., especially on the Anacostia, during the woodland period are both ceramics, like these, and these were, we know, primarily made by women. They would use things like cordage and sticks, and uh, they would take shell and actually temper these with them. You can actually see it on some of them. And women and both men also used stone tools, like this. This was actually a scraper. You would take this, you would have a recently uh, killed animal that was brought to you. We are so excited because um, the museum, of course, represents the history of the past. Um, we haven't been able to uh, move uh, perhaps from the 1900s forward. Um, but every year, uh, as we dig more and more into our research of our past, um, we are excited to find so many new things that we can share with the general public and especially the students that come here to visit. And uh, so we want to start with um, talking about our Confederacy. So the Piscataway were, was the largest tribe in this area. Um, and we had a Confederacy of about nine lower or sub-tribes. I wouldn't say lower because that always means demeaning, but sub-tribes. Um, they were smaller bands of us, and uh, one of those were the Anacostians, that their main area was near the Anacostia River. And uh, that's something that we're starting to revisit and learn about as well, because this area was a, a really strong area for trade, even within, within our nations, prior to European contact. Mm -hmm. So it's like DC is such a big area for you know law and politics and it was that way prior to European contact as well. Well African Americans um, have been in the Chesapeake Bay region DC Maryland and Virginia since the mid 17th century. Um, as far as interactions with Native Americans there is some intermarriages that we know of but most likely um, Native Americans would have taken African Americans as slaves, as did European settlers. Um, the D.C. area in particular has a high incidence of free and enslaved African Americans. Enslaved African Americans um, felt that D.C. was almost an area of freedom. It was a border that couldn't be crossed or that could be crossed between slavery and freedom. So many times when they escaped the South, they would pass through D.C. into Maryland towards Pennsylvania and Delaware. So women had a very, very diverse role in um, Native American culture during uh, the woodland contact and probably even before that. Uh, we know from um, the European explorers who came to Virginia 
and even DC that women not only farmed and planted uh, the fields, they also were responsible for rearing and caring for the children. They were responsible for butchering the meat and tanning and, um, and producing hide. They also brought in fish from the fish weirs. They built houses. They actually built the houses, and that's probably why a lot of the houses were located next to fields. Um, they were responsible for many of the decorative arts. They would have made things like these beautiful necklaces, which are also reproductions. And um, these would have been either made into a necklace or sewn on into clo to clothing. Um, and you could use them for trading, or you could give it to one of the chief's wives, or if you're rich enough, you'd wear it yourself. Um, women also were baking the bread, and not only baking the bread, they would actually go out and dig out uh, the tuckahoe, the, the tuber-producing plant, which was extremely, extremely hard work. Um, women also may have helped um, dig out canoes. They, um, it was hard work, and, and you can't imagine that men and boys did it all themselves. Uh, they would also tattoo um, a part of a decorative art. As you can see, Native Americans had a very intricate tattoo designs. You can see here on a woman some of the tattoos she would have had. Uh, they would have brought in firewood. They would have brought fresh water into spring water into the camp to make the stew for the day. They they did so so much work, and their bodies actually reflect the work that they did. Um, Native American women's skeletons from this time period are actually more robust than many of the common of of this period's men's skeletons. So we know that they led very active and energetic lives. Okay. So clan mothers had a very, very important role in uh, counseling the werewants, which was the leader of your town, and then the werewants would then talk to the Tayak and say, from my town or village, this is what our people think. The first project I had was um, researching the Anacostia River because the project, the program, the issue was environmental groups were starting to put effort and energy around the river, but communities, because the trash was the issue, so even if you did a pickup, unless you got to the root of why people were it, uh, littering, we never got there. So I did all kinds of programming with different organizations, Anacostia Watershed Society, kind of with the Aquatic Gardens, but it was based on the fact that I learned the history of this river and was so passionate about it because I felt like it was like it had suffered an injustice like it gave so much to the building of, of, of DC in terms of being a, a main waterway for probably the con you know the, the um, granite and everything that the, the the city was built on but then after they finished using it they went to the other side not to mention what they did to the people on the land very very early on uh, we were pushed away from the waters and the waters were very important to us. Uh, quite naturally, we can think of the things that we use water for, um, for bathing, for cooking, um, food, um, and for trade. Uh, our way of traveling is with either foot or canoe. And so we need the water in order to travel. And the, wa the bodies of waters, the De Potomac, the Anacostian, and all of those kind of blend into each other. So it weren't this like group of people who just stayed at Piscataway Creek or, you know, that's the only place we went. We traveled these waters and over to the Chesapeake, uh, which was teeming with wildlife and uh, aquatic life. 
And um, so we did a lot of traveling using these very bodies of water. But after Euro European contact, they needed to be able to use those bodies of water to ship the main product which they came here for was tobacco. Um, shipping tobacco, growing tobacco here in Virginia and Maryland, and then shipping it back to England. And so because of that, they pushed us further and further away from the water. And I f feel very sad about that, especially when people ask us about our relationship to the water. Well, I was not born in 16-something, nor was I born in 17-something. So my relationship to the water is much different now than it was for my ancestors. But we did everything we possibly could to stay as close to the water as we could without being uh, tormented by European encroachment and the like. But we still use the water for fishing, and um, especially fishing, and uh, swimming, and, and uh, uh, water activities, as you would say. They, they turned the Potomacs against. I mean, it was the same ideal of colonialism, but they don't, you know, they don't talk about that. It just starts as the nation's river, and they don't even realize what that really meant mm -hmm. as the nation's river. Like this the ecosystems, the fact that things still thrive here just makes me go, yes. And yeah, and, and they're not only thriving. I mean, communities have been here, growing families. Yes. Growing but movies. they haven't been able to swim in the river. Like yes. that's messed up. That's really I was talking to somebody yesterday, they were like, yeah, we still can't eat the fish and we still can't swim in the river. Um, but we can go to the baseball game right. and we can go on a boat with some people that, mm -hmm. you know, don't really connect with our lives. Well, as a child, I could walk barefoot because there weren't any, there wasn't any glass. You know, it was maybe rocks and things like that, but they didn't affect my feet. But as I grew older, you had to wear shoes because the ground was so polluted with so much dirt and trash and everything. So I couldn't feel protected, my feet, from being cut. Well, I always remember um, rolling around in the grass <laughs> as a child and just running around in our front yard and backyard and smelling the flowers and the trees and the fruit trees. We had blackberries, pear trees, cherry trees, peach trees, all types of, you know, for the city, we had a lot of that back in the 50s and the 60s, and I'm getting ready to tell my age in a minute. <laughs> okay. My environment, like you said, we were younger. I used to see, uh, what is it, rabbits roaming around and turtles. We had turtles when we first moved over to where we live at. It was a, what, these gigantic turtles. Actually, it was a big turtle that was in our backyard, and the snails were back there. My father had to call the zoo to could come get the turtle and take it to the zoo because it was roaming around. I mean, it was, I guess it was a tortoise. I don't know, but it was that huge. Well, I think one has to consider what the earth is. The earth is the only thing that has absolute color in it. Earth that is without color is without foliage. And therefore, uh, people sort of see it as being dirty, as being nasty, as being something that is not going to be of any value for you because everybody says if you get dirt on you, wash it off. Or, uh, you, or that's not clean. And so cleanliness and those kinds of things are associated with the lack of color. And so earth per se, since it does not lack color, has something that would be psychologically negative in the mind of kids. Even parents reinforce that notion. Go ahead and wash that dirt off of you. The children see not washing dirt away, they see taking the color of whatever it is there away. And in some way they associate that as well. So if you were to talk to children about it, and you didn't in an age 
sp and age spaces, you will find that the older you get, the more loyal you are to the earth where you are, and the more protective you become thereof, so that it can be maintained as it should have been and as should be in order for us as a people on the earth to be able to survive. I find that Mother Earth is a source of healing. I find that the water in particular and the trees is just a wonderful kind of environment um, for people who are struggling and for people who are troubled to find peace. Um, and you establish this sort of connection with the earth that way. And I just find the water in particular very healing. Le damos por abierto los cuatro puntos cardinales de nuestra madre tierra. In the opening, we uh, acknowledge the four directions of Mother Earth. Gracias por invitarme a ese encuentro de nuestros hermanos eh, morenos que estamos acá reunidos como indígenas, como naciones. Thank you for inviting me to this encounter of the African peoples and the indigenous peoples. Quiero pedirles, hermanos y hermanas, agárrense la mano, vamos a dar gracias al Creador. I'd like to ask you, brothers and sisters, to hold each other's hands. Let's give thanks to the Creator. Gracias por mis abuelos y mi padre, Adrián Esquino Lisco, cacique de los Nahualén, Casimaya, El Salvador. Thank you to my grandfathers and to my father, Chief Adrián Esquino Lisco. Let 
As all indigenous based religion, we are very much connected to the earth. We believe that everything comes from the earth and we believe that we must honor, we must respect, and we must give homage to all the traditions that honor the earth and honor nature. So we honor the earth, we honor the, the, the trees, we honor the waters, the ocean, the seas. We honor every aspect of nature because we know that um, these things were here before human beings were here. So we give honor to all these things as they reflect the various manifestations of God. And that's coming from the east of the river in southeast DC. We have a shrine there where we um, plant prayer flags and where we have shrines for all the deities, the red, the right, the brown, all the paths can come there. So I notice that in all of our meditation practices, in all of our traditions, require that we touch the land. And that's because the land has so many lessons for us. As we redeem our souls in these healing practices, we're also redeeming the soil. And that's the message that I'm sharing with people today because of climate change. Because we've run away from all of those lessons, now it's time to come back. Come back to the original lesson of taking care of Mother Earth so that we learn how to take care of one another. In addition to biodiversity and cultural diversity, what we learn is that the way we care for the earth is the way we care for each other. When we destroy one, we destroy the other. When we abuse the land and force it to only grow one plant, when we have monoculture, then it requires that we have abused people to work on the land. And so that's why we need to get away from these industrialized practices and get back to the original ways of relating to the earth. I think they've always come to Anacostia Park. They've always used the river. They, they didn't get on the river, right. but they came down here and fished, hosted their family reunions in this park. This park has been like essential to the, the, at least the environmental culture or the nature culture of these neighborhoods. Fort DuPont is pretty awesome too. Like that's the other ironic thing. For Southeast to be at some one time such a crazy place, it always had beautiful things and it was actually fertile soil. Um, we live uh, so close to the, what is called Anacostia River. We come from that area of the city and um, it was just wonderful to see the river flowing, you know, and it was clean during that time. So now the environment has gotten it so dirty, they went back to cleaning it up. I think it's, it's project clean up or something. I they're trying to get it together now rejuvenate this border or whatever, you know, so. And it's, it's a good feeling now to know that it's coming together. They're trying to get the pollution away from us and all that. And not to litter, not to litter, mm -hmm. because it's ugly and it's unhealthy 
And it's just not right to just throw trash all over the earth. It's not right. Sit by, by the river bank, and it really used to calm us, you know, calm us down when we go. And um, exactly where we lived, we could see airplanes when we were little flying across, and I used to be afraid of them. <laughs> but, um, yeah, my mother would get us ready for bed, and then we would go sit out on our porch or in the backyard and just, you know, relax. Back then, we could have a teepee in the yard, but now it's gotten so polluted and everything around in the area. The flowers are disappearing. Everything is kind of like disappearing. Yeah, so, but hopefully someday we'll get it back. I have done some work uh, in east of the river, um, and that work was when I was with um, uh, the National Parks Conservation Association, um, and a lot of that was really, you know, ad attempting to find ways um, to create more opportunities uh, for folks who are east of the river um, and in other places, um, and to kind of get folks to the place that we have an understanding of, um, you know, that that we we um, are in a country where we literally have something that's called the National Park Service and have, we have these national parks um, all around the country and, and part of my work has been to find more ways to create more opportunities for people from all communities, east of the river, out here in Fort Washington, you know, all that, um, to be able to engage more um, with these amazing places um, that, you know, we wake up and we breathe every day because we have trees. <laughs> so, so, yeah, creating opportunities for all of us to kind of understand and value that stuff. Um, and as times have changed and people have changed, um, what we've been, what I think most many women now have begun to understand, it's like this is not just for guys. This is for me too, you know. And again, when you go somewhere, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm going to say Bryce Canyon and stuff, where you go somewhere. Um, and where you're able and see, you know, and you kind of go, wow, <laughs> this cannot just be for one group of people. This has to be here for all of us. Does that make sense? Even when, even though it's male dominated, you got females that I think maybe as a result of the male dominated 
way that you feel like you have to operate. Women have just turned cold to the real mission of, of nurturing. And so there's, you know, the field of environmental education, I don't think was really, for me at least in my 20s and my years being an environmental educator, it never embraced those things that I felt that made us really successful, which were the relationships with the communities. All they cared about was the day, snap the picture, count the trash, Mm -hmm. Look at the frog, but they weren't thinking about those kids and the trauma, the, the effects of the trauma in their neighborhoods. When I was working in the 90s on the river, they were just starting the Anacostia Waterfront Corporation or somebody, but they go out and do these listening sessions and what do you want and we're going to build around what you care about and da 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 and use people like me and Brenda Richardson to bring our networks in and, you know, I think because gentrification happens everywhere, there's like a model and you know when it's happening. And I guess we just at that time, were still living the reality of it that we weren't projecting or seeing even a place in any of this. So this wasn't a surprise. So when I went away for six years, I came back. I kind of, I kind of have not been active in the Anacostia community as, as much as I was you know, prior to leaving. And coming back, I do see some things, the needle has moved forward on some things, but just the, the rate of gentrification that's happened here is just crazy for me to see certain cultures and certain communities. And unfortunately, you know, in some cases people have been pushed out and I don't think that necessarily the cultures around those people are picking up. And it's just two separate things going on in the same neighborhood, which is not community. We often say that those of us that live on the, in, on the east side are like the have-nots, and those on this side are the haves. So one of the things that a lot of us are trying to do is to use the river as a bridge to bring both of the communities together. And the beauty of it is that it's a river. You see how peaceful? and calmness is, and I, I think it's a perfect venue for communities to connect. So I started working with the Earth Conservation Corps back in 1996, I think it was, and they, they didn't have any of that. The pump house was there, but it was, yeah, they had, the pump house was there, but it was jacked, but they had a trailer. That's what they worked out of, and this was like one of their first cores, I think if not, that's probably around for the first or second core. And um, girl, the kids he was bringing in were just like straight, real kids. Mm -hmm. And I was hired to teach them environmental education. And during one of our sessions, the kid was like, oh, F about da 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 And it wasn't at me. It was legitimate statements. And I thought it shook me in a very good way, though, because it made me go. Uh, immediately, I changed the subject to what they wanted to go into, but not in a way that they bullied it. But I went, I pulled out where their thoughts were coming from and what do you care about, you know what I mean? Because it was, it was uh, unrealistic for me to go in there and think that I was gonna put my environmental values on them, which weren't really mine, but I was an environmental educator and that's what I thought I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> Thank you.
So the pump house is 100 years old, and what it was used to do was take the water from the Anacostia River and pump it up to the capital, actually pump it up to a factory, which then led to the capital, which it was turned into steam. But the river got so polluted that they had to shut it down. So the building sat for like 50, 60 years until one man, uh, until a man named Bob Nixon found the building through like a pile of trash. He yeah. saw the building from uh, the Douglas Bridge. Mm -hmm. And when he came down the street to, to see this building, he couldn't, he couldn't find it. it. He didn't see it from the street. So he went back on the bridge to make sure that he had the correct location, mm -hmm. came back down here and climbed over a wall, of a wall of trash. And once he got over the wall of trash, there were abandoned school buses all along the bank of the river. This whole area that um, the pump house is at now used to be a trash dump. So he uh, climbed up all the trash and then he asked the city, could he have a lease to this building so that he could turn it into a community center. And him along with um, members of Earth Conservation Corps and Navy CBs uh, refurbished this building. So Earth Conservation Corps is an environmental is an environmental program and the mission is to reclaim the Anacostia River, its neighboring communities and the lives that surround it. Um, Bob Nixon founded this program in 1992 because um, he saw an article about the Anacostia, about how a river so small was just so polluted. It was one of the most polluted rivers in our country and it's only, what, 8.5 miles? Like one of the smallest rivers but also one of the most polluted. So he came down and he got some young people to um, come and try to clean a river. Um, this program is based here in Southeast Washington, D.C. And before now, now, this neighborhood has changed so much um, with the stadium being built and, you know, developments coming up everywhere. But I grew up in this neighborhood. Well, honestly, uh, yeah, this program definitely had a huge impact on the community um, that was here before. Um, just because it was a direct connection to the river, um, it wasn't necessarily, um, people didn't necessarily come to this program because they cared so much about the environment or about the river. They came to this program as a means of survival. Uh, this program provided a lot of people, including me, with um, help with finishing our educations, um, just money in our pockets so that we could um, feed our families and take care of our basic needs. And while doing those things, uh, this program, Earth Conservation Corps, opened up the community's eyes to the problems that the river was facing and, and how it um, directly affects the neighborhoods around it. Um, you know, we're, we aren't the only neighborhoods that are, that are bordering up parts of a river. You know, we have the Potomac, Rock Creek Park, and stuff like that, but those neighborhoods don't face the same problems that a neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in faced with um, is, was a high crime area, a high drug area. So um, when you grow up in a neighborhood like that, your, your first thoughts aren't, let me save a river, let me plant a tree. Your first thoughts are, let me get out of this neighborhood, let me survive it. Um, and when you are in a more affluent neighborhood, you have that luxury of, of playing outside and enjoying your neighborhood and enjoying your river and your parks. Um, you don't have that when you grow up in a neighborhood that um, you need to be in before it gets dark. You don't have that when you live in a neighborhood like that. And this program open this program gave access to the river back to the community that the that that, that the river borders. Uh, the Anacostia River borders a lot of less prominent neighborhoods, or it did. And the program, um, the program gave access back to the community, to, to a river. It gave us a sense of ownership over what was in our own neighborhood. I, the, the river wise, I think there's been a lot of uh, movement around um, policy to make the river clean and it's actually great to see so many people active and using the river. But it still bothers me because the river is still dirty. It's still unswimmable, unfishable, like, and a lot of that has to do with regulations that are allowed in the river. So if we really wanted to do something, I feel like we, right. we really could, but when you got people not holding people accountable, 
you know, we still have to struggle with issues around water quality. And not because of the river, but the same things that go on in the neighborhood, the, the crime, the pollution in the neighborhoods. But again, I, I do feel hopeful. What were you doing those three years ago? Because I remember meeting you with a bike and a trailer. <laughs> oh my gosh, and I was selling plants over in that corner. That was the beginning yeah. of everything. Oh, I almost forgot that. That was the first market that I went to. Right. I had been working at an organic farm in Upper Marlboro for six years and decided to start out on my own and start my own farm in D.C. because I was living in D.C. This is my community. These, you know, these are my people. So wanted to grow food close to home. And I was looking for land, scouting land, trying to get started. And the only thing I had at that time was a greenhouse in my backyard. And I was growing plants for what farm I didn't have yet. I had no idea. I just bought seeds and I was growing plants in February, March. I didn't know what I was going to do. And they had that sale here in the parking lot. And I brought the plants and that's when I met you guys. Yeah. And you only had one kid. I only had one kid. <laughs> Awesome. Yep. What else you got? And, um, we do a lot of... Where does this come from? This, our vegetable production is called Three Part Harmony Farm. That's my farm, mostly in D.C. But I'm a member of a co-op called Community Farming Alliance, which is a um, D.C. Mid-Atlantic based co-op for women and um, uh, non-white, I guess you would say minority, gender non-conforming farmers. So. We um, work together, support each other. Like um, our members are in DC right now. We have three members. Mm -hmm. We have Three Part Harmony Farm, which is the vegetables. Good Sense Farm and Apiary is the mushrooms and the bees. And then Little Redbird Botanicals is a medicinal. So, um, so when people come here on Tuesdays, they can opt in to get the vegetables, but they can additionally choose to get the other items from our co-op members as well. My interaction with the people who are nourished from the food that I grow is different, and that is that people are eating food that grows where they live when it grows. Like, people are really used to going to the store and they pick up the eggplant and they are like, oh, I want to eat this eggplant, but it's February and there's snow on the ground outside. You're not going to eat that eggplant here in the Middle Atlantic region in February. It's going to be July, August, September, October. And it sometimes surprises me because I'm so used to that rhythm now. But that is such an important part of coming here every week and seeing what's on this table and then knowing like that is what our earth gave us this week and that's normal where we live, you know? Yeah. Then you're in a different relationship with where you are and the earth, the soil, because you're learning how to eat what comes, what she gives you. Yeah. That's all you can do is, is take what she gives you. African-American women are famous for, um, I guess, their creations with soul food. So in southern areas um, and in the Washington, D.C. area, women were responsible for cooking. So with Af um, soul food, before, before the Civil War, they were able to create dishes um, with the permission of their mistress. After the Civil War, um, mistresses or former mistresses wanted to continue those same rich soul food traditions, so they employed African American women to cook in, again in their kitchen. Now, a lot of this we know through cookbooks. While uh, African American women weren't credited, we know that some of the same patterns and recipes um, that are found in maybe a Southern mistress's cookbook are the same types of recipes that are known through slave narratives. That's what really inspired me. And again, my great aunt, who just was so amazing and used to plant stuff all the time. So for her, it was about, it's not just us, but it's also the trees and the birds and all the other stuff and the flowers. And you know, when you make that connection, then you're making the connection to something bigger than you, Iantha. You're making the connection to God or whatever we call it, spirit, life, energy. 
Um, and so that's how I got to this place and why I love what I do every day of my life. Leadership is when we're all in union and community. Like I could be a leader per se. I'm, I'm actually, there's a leadership called servant leadership. Yeah. I feel like I'm a servant leader because I don't really, I don't really care about any of the exterior of how it looks or what people think about it. Mm -hmm. All I care is that I have it to give. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of communities, modeling, I, my, being a person of color, and that's a woman, and they see me in these meetings, running these meetings, or they see me on these teams, or they see me, or they keep seeing us, and now that I have that platform, guess who I'm trying to put on, on blast? People of color, mm -hmm. through everything I do. And you know, I get some pushback from some folks, but you can't sit down and tell me that that's not needed and necessary and yeah, essential if you really want this movement to be for all. We have a, uh, a lot of celebrations that we celebrate. Most of them are agricultural based. And so in uh, the spring is our new year. Not in January. January, everything is dormant. And so in April and May, when the world is coming back and being renewed, that is when we get together. And uh, then we have a harvest celebration, and then we have a fall celebration, and then a winter where we remember those who have gone on to the spirit world. And in between that, we have uh, various small celebrations that uh, uh, we did not celebrate birthdays back then, but we certainly did celebrate when a boy and a girl became of age. And so one thing I wanted to point out when Crystal uh, had her coming of age uh, gathering, a party. Um, Rosy yeah. <laughs> uh, many elders participate in this and they look you in your eyes and they want you to understand your responsibility as a child coming out of childhood and working into adulthood. And she didn't realize it at the time, she's taking my place. It's time for her to step into my place as it was a time for me when I stepped into my grandma's place. And this is going to keep moving from generation to generation. And there may be times when we're frustrated, we say, oh, we don't want to do this. But we have to, there's something that's in our DNA that cannot let this go. And so we will continue to celebrate these celebrations and pass it down from one generation to the next, whatever that may be. Because also from one generation to the next, it's different. 
it's different. We have several ways that we connect with the earth. Um, for rituals, we always go and pour libation. Libation is the first form of prayer. So we always pour libation, giving the first part of everything back to Mother Earth. And from there, we look to Mother Earth to provide everything that we need for our rituals, for the herbs for the plants, for the flowers, for the box that we use to wash our sacred implements, to wash um, ourselves to, for st spiritual bath and the likes. We use everything that the earth provides. We know that God said this. He said, the herbs are for the healing of the nation. And so we turn to everything that the earth produces for our healing and for the healing of the nation. I can't imagine my life without these trees. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? It's like, I just can't imagine it. And again, it goes all the way back to when I was a kid, you know? Somebody taught me that trees and birds and flowers and all those beautiful things will keep you here much longer than if you don't engage it in them. And um, so anyhow. I think that one of the things that we can all do as a daily spiritual practice is touch the soil, cultivate a plant, and learn how to follow the seasons of harvest and celebration, of weeding. All of these are practices that we need to learn as human beings. Oh. <laughs> 